Hello viewers, in this video I'm going to be talking about blood transfusions and before I begin I just want to make it absolutely clear who I'm addressing in this video because obviously many of you watching this won't necessarily be Jehovah's Witnesses or maybe you were once a Jehovah's Witness and you no longer believe and I appreciate you watching this video and my hope is that you will enjoy it and find it informative. But I hope you don't mind if I direct this video primarily to believing Jehovah's Witnesses or former Jehovah's Witnesses who still hold on to the belief that blood transfusions should be refused. So the title of this video, as you'll have seen, is seven questions for Jehovah's Witnesses on blood transfusions. I believe that this information is most relevant to believing Jehovah's Witnesses, so that's who I'm going to be talking to. So with all that out of the way, let me go through the questions that I'm going to be asking and answering, and you'll notice that I'm also providing the timing for each answer in the video so that if there's a particular question that you're most interested in, you can, if you want to, just skip straight to where that question is dealt with. But the seven questions are as follows. When did the blood teaching originate? Is the blood teaching internally consistent? Do witnesses abstain for medical or religious reasons? Is the blood prohibition a Bible command? Is abstaining from blood a personal decision? Is it ethical to deny blood transfusions for children? And finally, is the blood teaching worth dying for? So let's get straight into answering our first question. When did the blood teaching originate? So just by way of providing a little bit of context, there's a long history going back many decades in Watchtower literature, particularly to the earliest beginnings of the Watchtower movement. There's a long history of the organisation dabbling in medical matters and giving advice to its readers on medical issues. So, for example, you can find Watchtower quotes condemning the germ theory of disease, you can find Watchtower quotes condemning aluminium cookware or aluminium cookware for those of you in America. You can find Watchtower quotes condemning vaccination. All sorts of, you know, medical quackery basically can be found in some of the earliest spiritual food produced by Watchtower. So it's really no surprise that as time passed, they took an interest in blood transfusions, particularly getting into the sort of 1940s when blood transfusions were more widely available for people. What's interesting is that there is actually a 1940 Consolation article, and for those of you who don't know, Consolation was the forerunner to the Awake magazine. It went Golden Age, Consolation, Awake magazine. So we're talking one of the main vehicles of spiritual food for Jehovah's Witnesses. There was an article, a brief article published in the 1940 Consolation. It was the December 25th magazine on page 19, which read as follows. In New York City, a housewife, in moving a boarder's things, accidentally shot herself through the heart with his revolver. She was rushed to a hospital, her left breast was cut around, four ribs were cut away, the heart was lifted out, three stitches were taken, one of the attending physicians in the great emergency gave a quart of his blood for transfusion, and today the woman lives and smiles gaily over what happened to her in the busiest 23 minutes of her life. Now, granted, it makes no comment on whether it was proper for this woman to receive a blood transfusion, but you would almost think, reading this, that it's actually no big deal that this woman received uh, someone else's blood as part of her medical treatment. 
And yet, within just a few years, Watchtower was to take a really firm stand on this issue in the 1945 January 7th Watchtower on page 201, Watchtower said the following, Seeing then that the Most High and Holy God gave plain instructions as to the disposition of blood in harmony with his everlasting covenant made with Noah and all his descendants, and seeing that the only use of blood that he authorized in order to furnish life to humankind was the use of it as a propitiation or atonement for sin, and seeing that it was to be done upon his holy altar or at his mercy seat, and not by taking such blood directly into the human body, therefore it behooves all worshippers of Jehovah who seek eternal life in his new world of righteousness to respect the sanctity of blood and to confirm themselves to God's righteous ruling concerning this vital matter. So in 1945, it was decided that it was wrong for Jehovah's Witnesses to receive blood medically. And by 1961, it became a disfellowshipping offence for a Jehovah's Witness to receive blood. You could be ejected from the organisation and shunned if you received a blood transfusion. Now, as of today, it's not a disfellowshipping offence, but it is a disassociation offence. So if you consult the Elder's Guidebook, the Shepherd the Flock of God book, you can clearly see that listed under the actions that would be considered as disassociation, you can see there willingly and unrepentantly taking blood. So it effectively means the same thing as disfellowshipping. If you receive a blood transfusion and you're not sorry for it, you will be disassociated by the elders and shunned. So that's the briefest of histories on where this blood teaching came from. Basically, we are talking about a teaching that was dreamt up in 1945, only a few years after in Watchtower Spiritual Food, blood transfusions were described as though they really weren't a big deal. By 1945, suddenly they are terrible, they're to be avoided. By 1961, they're a disfellowshipping offence and they basically continue to be an offence for which you can be shunned to this day. My question to you as a Jehovah's Witness watching this would be, why did it take so long for this to become an issue for Jehovah's organization? We know that blood has been being transfused medically since the 19th century, and yet it takes 26 years after Watchtower is invisibly chosen by Jesus in 1919 to be his faithful and discreet slave. It takes 26 years from 1919 to 1945 for them to figure out that it would be this awful, awful thing if a Jehovah's Witness were to receive blood. If it's so serious and such a grave offence to Jehovah, why did it take over two decades for God's faithful and discreet slave to figure this out? Now that we know a little bit about where this blood teaching comes from, we can get on with tackling our second question, which is, is the blood teaching internally consistent? And in answering this question, I want to talk a little bit about the fractions provision. And as you will know, if you are a Jehovah's Witness, in the year 2000, the teaching changed somewhat in that witnesses were allowed as a conscience matter to accept certain blood derivatives so long as they weren't accepting either whole blood or one of the four main components of blood. Before we proceed further, it's worth 
stating what the four main components of blood are and how they've come to be thought of as the four main components of blood. Basically, if you take a vial of blood and you spin it in a laboratory centrifuge, what you will find is that the red blood cells drift down to the bottom, the clear plasma moves to the top, and in between the layer of plasma and the layer of red blood cells, you get what's called a buffy coat containing platelets and white blood cells. So those are your four main components of blood, red blood cells, plasma, platelets, and white blood cells. All of these are prohibited for Jehovah's Witnesses to receive intravenously as a medical treatment. However, as of 2000, the rules changed so that if you could derive a treatment from one of those individual components, if you could, for example, extract the hemoglobin from a red blood cell, well, it would be a conscience matter. You could, in theory, accept this without fear of punishment, and it would be purely between you and God as to whether this was acceptable or not. And this teaching was announced in the June 15, 2000 Watchtower. I'm quoting now from page 29. Jehovah's Witnesses hold that accepting whole blood or any of those four primary components violates God's law. Significantly, keeping to this Bible-based position has protected them from many risks including such diseases as hepatitis and AIDS that can be contracted from blood. However, since blood can be processed beyond those primary components, questions arise about fractions derived from the primary blood components. How are such fractions used and what should a Christian consider when deciding on them? So again, as of this Watchtower article, basically, Jehovah's Witnesses were allowed as a conscience matter to accept certain fractions that were derived from the four main components of blood. Now, I can actually remember this provision being introduced and having some serious questions to ask myself as to whether I would personally accept fractions now that I was, in theory, allowed to as a Jehovah's Witness. And the conclusion I came up with was that I would have to refuse the fractions even if I was allowed them because I couldn't accept that I would be receiving something that had been derived from donated blood when I wasn't donating blood myself and my fellow Jehovah's Witnesses weren't donating blood themselves. We as Witnesses were receiving something through the altruism of non-witnesses that would save our lives when we were unwilling to reciprocate by giving our own blood so that it could be used to produce these fractions. So that's just one immediate example of the internal inconsistencies in the blood teaching and specifically the 2000 fractions provision. But there's more. Because when you are a Jehovah's Witness, you are taught to believe that the only acceptable use of blood is in sacrifice. And if blood isn't being used in divinely appointed sacrifice, such as the sacrifices that were made by the ancient Israelites, where there was this huge list of laws and provisions that were handed down by God, if blood wasn't being used in one of those approved ways, then it should be spilled out on the ground. And any blood that isn't spilled out on the ground or used in a way that's been approved by God is basically to be considered stolen. You've stolen it from God. God is the originator of life. The life is in the blood. So any use of blood beyond what God approves is a misappropriation of blood. Now, just think about that for a moment and let me read to you from the book In Search of Christian Freedom 
by Raymond Franz, who is a former, who, who was a former governing body member, now deceased, he makes some very interesting observations. On pages 288 and 289, Franz reproduces part of a letter from a friend who's giving some very compelling reasoning on this issue, and he writes, The blood, it is claimed, belongs to God but that is conveniently forgotten when the use of blood fractions is pronounced tolerable. But it would hardly do to accept for any secular use what exclusively belongs to God, because that would be the same as using stolen property. A stolen car is a stolen car, and it would not make the theft more tolerable if the car is separated into primary components say the motor, coach and the transmission, and then separated further into fractions, such as carburetor, pistons, hood, doors and drive shaft. Only if the car is not stolen would one have the right to take it apart and use or sell it as small parts. And if the car is not stolen, all parts, both big and small, can properly be separated and used at will. So if blood fractions can be tolerated, certainly the major components and even whole blood can. This was such an important point because the guy who wrote this is spot on. Either blood is allowed or it isn't. If it's not allowed to use blood for any other purpose than sacrifice, it doesn't suddenly become acceptable just because you've taken a tiny, tiny part of that blood and used it for something else. Either it's okay to use whole blood for reasons other than sacrifice, for, say, medical reasons, or it isn't. The fractions provision that was brought in again in 2000 is internally inconsistent and irrational. Now at this point in the video I just want to make it abundantly clear that I'm not trying to talk Jehovah's Witnesses into refusing fractions. If you're watching this as a witness I actually want you to accept fractions, I even want you to accept whole blood. The point of this discussion is just to show you how logically inconsistent the fractions provision is and if the fractions provision is inconsistent, it stands to reason that quite likely the entire blood teaching is logically flawed as well. That's the whole point of going into the fractions provision in this detail. Another big problem with the fractions provision is how arbitrary it is in distinguishing between the four main components and fractions such as haemoglobin. So again, we arrive at the four main components by putting a vial of blood in, lab in a laboratory centrifuge and spinning it. Why would God use that to determine what the, four, what the main components of blood are? Why would God be interested in how blood responds in a laboratory centrifuge and how blood is separated in that specific process versus the role played by the actual ingredients of blood. And to drive home this point, you'll remember that red blood cells are one of the main components of blood. Well, what is a red blood cell? A red blood cell is a disc-shaped cell that is pretty much a wrapper containing haemoglobin. If you could just peel open that red blood cell, what you would have inside is just haemoglobin. And haemoglobin is a protein that the body uses to transfer oxygen. When we breathe in oxygen in the air, that works its way into the blood, and it's the haemoglobin in your blood that transfers that oxygen that you breathe to all of the various parts of your body that need oxygen. Haemoglobin is actually the reason why your blood is red. It's a significant part of your blood. It's actually, it actually makes up 15% of blood volume. And yet, amazingly, if there were a way to use this haemoglobin all by itself, 
Watchtower would be fine with that. And incidentally, you can't just inject hemoglobin and it will perform the same role as red blood cells. There needs to be some way of transferring it. You need to have something like the wrapper of the red blood cell in order for it to do its job. But nevertheless, if there were a way to just utilize the hemoglobin, Watchtower would be fine with that. And they've even published in the 2006 Our Kingdom Ministry, I'm going to show you now where they've allowed witnesses to tick to say that they would accept hemoglobin if that were on offer. So Watchtower has no problem with Jehovah's Witnesses, with you Jehovah's Witnesses who are watching this, receiving into your bodies the, the thing that makes your blood red and the thing that is responsible for carrying oxygen to your bodies. Just think about how little sense that makes. When we're talking about red blood cells, the body's natural carriers of hemoglobin, it would be an abomination for you to receive those according to Watchtower. But if you could peel them open and get to the hemoglobin inside and just use the hemoglobin by itself, suddenly that would be acceptable. And to highlight just how irrational this is, I'm going to go back to Ray Franz's book, In Search of Christian Freedom, because he continues, I think his friend continues talking about the haemoglobin. He writes on page 290, with or without the peel, an orange is still an orange. If a method to remove the segments of an orange and arrange the segments in groups of four without peel is invented, the product will still be an orange, and nobody would call it anything else. In the same way, slimmed red cells, freed and prepared haemoglobin, will remain blood. Therefore, to say that taking in red blood cells is a sin while accepting the freed vital haemoglobin is not, is downright pharisaic hypocrisy. Again, when we're talking about haemoglobin, we're talking about something that makes up 15% of your body's blood. By comparison, white blood cells, which are one of those parts of your blood that get fractionated in a laboratory centrifuge, White blood cells make up only 1% of your blood, and yet they are prohibited, purely because it's possible to separate white blood cells in a laboratory centrifuge. Whereas because haemoglobin can't be separated, because it's inside the, the wrapper, the red blood cells, well, that's okay. This makes no logical sense. Again, why would God create these laws based purely on how blood responds under centrifugal forces rather than the actual role it plays in the body. But we must press on to our third question, which is, do witnesses abstain for medical or religious reasons? And if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, a common response that you will give when asked about the blood teaching, say when you are doing the preaching work and someone says, well, isn't it true that you let your children die by refusing blood transfusions? As a witness, you are trained to respond with something like the following. Well, actually, lots of doctors nowadays are realizing that it's much safer to perform surgery and other treatments without the use of blood it's safer, it's better for the patient, it's a more effective way of doing medicine. And so by taking this position on blood transfusions, we're making things better, not just for ourselves, not just for Jehovah's Witnesses, but for all patients. So witnesses will give this medical reasoning for refusing blood transfusions. But is that honest? I would argue that no, it isn't honest. Because bottom line, the reasons why Jehovah's Witnesses refuse blood transfusions is because they are convinced this is a command in the Bible from God. 
and we're going to get to the whole issue of whether it is or isn't in the Bible later in this video. But again, it's purely religious. If blood transfusions had zero risk attached, and I'm going to go into the risk uh, very shortly, but basically almost all medical treatments have a degree of risk attached to them. When we're talking about serious medical intervention, there will be some risk attached. But hypothetically speaking, even if there were no risks attached to blood transfusions, even if there were no risks at all, Jehovah's Witnesses would still refuse them because as far as they're concerned, it's a command in the Bible. So I do find it rather disingenuous when you speak to witnesses, and I was guilty of it too as a witness, when you speak to witnesses and they try to pretend that it's a medical thing. And just to emphasize the fact that there isn't a medical argument against blood transfusions, I've pulled up a few figures for you from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute there I learned that each year almost 5 million Americans require blood transfusions. So 5 million Americans in the space of a year will require blood transfusions. That's how much blood is being transfused, if you can somehow imagine that. On the website of the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, they have like an FAQ section and one of these sections deals with viruses and infectious diseases. And I think it's worthwhile going through some of the points that are made here. Some infectious agents, such as HIV, can survive in blood and infect the person receiving the blood transfusion. To keep blood safe, blood banks carefully screen donated blood. The risk of catching a virus from a blood transfusion is very low. HIV. Your risk of getting HIV from a blood transfusion is lower than your risk of getting killed by lightning. Only about 1 in 2 million donations might carry HIV and transmit HIV if given to a patient. Hepatitis B and C the risk of getting a donation that carries hepatitis B is about 1 in 205,000. The risk for hepatitis C is 1 in 2 million. If you receive blood during a transfusion that contains hepatitis, you'll likely develop the virus. Variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, VCJD, this disease is the human version of mad cow disease it's a very rare yet fatal brain disorder. There is a possible risk of getting BCJD from a blood transfusion, although the risk is very low. Because of this, people who may have been exposed to BCJD aren't eligible blood donors. So maybe you'll remember from earlier in this video when Watchtower was unveiling its new light about blood fractions in 2000, they raised the issue of infections and particularly HIV. They said significantly keeping to this Bible-based position has protected them, Jehovah's Witnesses, from many risks including such diseases as hepatitis and AIDS that can be contracted from blood. And yet when we listen to what the professionals are telling us, they are telling us that it's a minute chance. It's obviously not zero chance, because whenever you are dependent upon the general population for donating blood, no matter how many safeguards you put in place, there's always the probability that one of those safeguards is going to fail in some way, and you're going to get an infected donor giving blood. But even so, the risks are so remote of you actually getting a disease, a serious disease, from a blood transfusion. As it said in the case of HIV, it said your risk of getting HIV from a blood transfusion 
is lower than your risk of getting killed by lightning, let's just, again, assuming you're watching this as a Jehovah's Witness, let's try and put this in perspective because I'm addressing this issue of is it medical or is it religious? And if your reasons for refusing blood transfusions are medical, I'm sorry, but they're just not good reasons. If you are put in a position where your life is in danger and your doctor says you will die if you don't receive a blood transfusion, are you going to say, well, the risk of me getting HIV is so great that I would rather die? <laughs> of course you're not. You're going to roll the dice every time if you truly value living that is, you're going to want to take your chances and based on these figures your chances are excellent that you will avoid any kind of infection and the risk is minimal. If it was say 50-50, let's say there's a 50-50 chance that you will be receiving infected blood. Personally, I would still take those odds. I would still want to know that there's half a chance that I'm going to survive. Again, with death being the only other option. But those aren't the odds. The odds aren't 50-50. The odds are infinitesimal that there will be any problems. So that, again, there are no good medical reasons. And to really drive this point home, I wanted to just share with you an example from Watchtower's past literature, past writings, of them trying this strategy of scaring people. Because that's what this amounts to. When they write about the risk of HIV infections, etc., and yes, I don't deny there's at least some risk, but when Watchtower does this, they're really not looking out for the welfare of Jehovah's Witnesses. They are trying to enforce their agenda, they're trying to justify their reasons for this uh, prohibition. But they've done this before with, with even worse reasons for refusing a blood transfusion. And I want to give you an example. It's actually from a 1961 watchtower, the September 15th watchtower. And this is on page 564 in the bound volume for that year. Allow me to read this quote. Dr. Americo Valerio, Brazilian doctor and surgeon for over 40 years, agrees. Moral insanity, sexual perversions, repression, inferiority complexes, petty crimes, these often follow in the wake of blood transfusion, he says. Yet it is acknowledged in the public press that organisations whose blood supply is considered reliable obtain blood for transfusion from criminals who are known to have such characteristics. Certainly, no one who is trying to depart from the works of the flesh and use his life in the way that God directs through his word is going to lay himself open to such a ruinous future. I kid you not, that is a serious quote from Spiritual Food published in a, in, by the Faithful Slave in a Watchtower magazine in 1961. They are seriously suggesting that you can receive someone else's moral insanity, sexual perversions, petty crimes by receiving their blood. That's the kind of medical quackery and pseudoscience that has informed Watchtower's thinking over the decades. And that's the kind of backwards reasoning that they've been willing to fall back on in their desperation to persuade Jehovah's Witnesses to refuse blood. But anyway, we must press on with our next question, which is, is the blood prohibition a Bible command? Jehovah's Witnesses, believing Jehovah's Witnesses watching this video will be adamant that it is a Bible command and they will draw our attention to Acts chapter 15 verse 29 where it says, 
Keep abstaining from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. Now, what most witnesses don't understand about this verse, because it isn't really shown in much context, is the motivation for urging Christians to abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood. The motivation behind urging Christians to do this was so that they wouldn't stumble others. And to show this, it's worth looking at 1 Corinthians 8, verses 8 to 10, where Paul writes, Food will not bring us nearer to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, nor better off if we eat. But keep watching that your right to choose does not somehow become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone should see you who have knowledge having a meal in an idle temple, will not the conscience of that one who is weak be emboldened to the point of eating food offered to idols? So again, what most witnesses don't understand is that the reason why this prohibition against blood and food sacrificed to idols was included in the first place wasn't because it was inherently wrong or inherently evil in and of itself. It was all about whether this had a capacity to stumble other believers. And interestingly, that's exactly how this prohibition was interpreted by Watchtower's founder, Charles Taze Russell. In a 1909 Watchtower, Russell wrote, it was advisable that the Gentile Christians abstain from the use of their liberty in this direction out of deference to the weaker brethren, Jews and Gentiles, who could not so deeply philosophize and whose consciences might be injured. But all of that nuance is entirely ignored by Watchtower. They zero in on the words keep abstaining from blood and they say, well, this is a concrete command and if the Bible says we are to abstain from eating blood, then we certainly wouldn't want to have it transfused into our bodies. And they even use in the literature, many witnesses watching this will be familiar with the analogy of a patient who is an alcoholic. Such a patient would be advised that a single drop of alcohol would be out of the question. It would send them spiraling into their alcoholism. So it would be out of the question for such a patient to have alcohol injected into his body intravenously. If he's not allowed to ingest the alcohol, why would he be allowed to have it injected straight into his veins? which is just a terrible analogy because alcohol is essentially a toxin and it's going to do pretty much the same thing whether you drink it or inject it straight into your blood veins. Blood is something completely different. If you ingest blood, it gets processed by your digestive system. But if you have blood transfused into your body, provided it's the correct match for your blood type, it immediately starts fulfilling a life-saving role. You cannot compare blood and alcohol. It's perfectly conceivable, if you want to believe that God created us, that God wants us to preserve our lives using whatever measures are necessary and objects to people eating blood, but actually wouldn't mind them using it medically again if life is in the balance. Bearing in mind the obvious, of course, which is that the Bible writers wouldn't have known anything about blood transfusions because people only started to transfuse blood in the 19th century. How could the Bible writers have had blood uh, the transfusing of blood in mind when they were writing these verses. But if you're a witness watching this, these aren't the only reasons why it cannot be said that the blood teaching is biblical. There's also a rabbinic principle which you really should look into known as pikuach nefesh. Pikuach nefesh is basically a rabbinic principle that would have been understood 
certainly by Jesus, but by, Jew, by Jews of his day, whereby the sanctity of life comes first, the preservation of life comes first, and there are no other laws that supersede the importance of keeping things alive. And there are numerous examples of Jesus referring to this principle in the conversations he had with religious leaders of his day. And one example can be found at Matthew chapter 12. If you look at verse 10, it says, So they asked him, they being the religious leaders, Is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? He said to them, If you have one sheep, and that sheep falls into a pit on the Sabbath, is there a man among you who will not grab hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do a fine thing on the Sabbath. Jesus was here appealing to Pichlach Nefesh. He was reasoning with the Jewish religious leaders that life comes first. And if you have a chance to save a life, whether it's human or animal, you drop everything else, you forget about any other restrictions such as the Sabbath, which was a big thing for Jews or continues to be a big thing for Jews. You drop everything else and you preserve life. So just by way of a recap, we've already considered multiple reasons why it cannot be said the blood teaching is biblical. Firstly, and most obviously, the Bible writers wouldn't have known anything about the medical use of blood. They would only have thought in terms of eating it, not in terms of its medical use. And as I've already explained, there's a huge difference between the role performed by blood when it's in your veins versus what happens to blood when it's in your digestive system. There's also the fact that when you cross-reference what Paul wrote, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it quickly becomes obvious that abstaining from eating blood wasn't because eating blood was evil in and of itself. It was really more to do with not stumbling other people. And there's also the rabbinic principle of Pichach Nefesh. I keep panicking that I'm going to mispronounce that. Which Watchtower seems to have completely overlooked. Which was a principle of appealed to by Jesus when arguing with the Pharisees, which said, look, the preservation of life clearly has to come first over all other considerations. But believe it or not, there's actually yet another reason why we can dismiss the blood teaching on biblical grounds. And to find this, we need only go to a Questions from Readers article that was published in a 1994 Watchtower the April 15th, 1994 Watchtower, page 31. And the question uh, under consideration was as follows. When Saul's soldiers ate meat along with the blood, why were they not executed since that was the punishment set out in God's law? Again, if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, I would urgently recommend that you seek out this particular article and you'll be amazed at some of the reasoning that Watchtower employs here. Basically, we're talking about an incident that's recorded in 1 Samuel 14, where due to a series of circumstances, Israelite soldiers, out of desperation, uh, slaughter animals on the ground and eat the meat along with the blood. And the obvious question then is, well, since... Eating blood is prohibited on pain of death in the Mosaic law. Why were these soldiers not executed? If it's such a huge deal, as far as Jehovah's concerned, how blood is used to the point where Jehovah's Witnesses are to die rather than receive a blood transfusion, why is it that these soldiers were allowed to eat meat with blood with seemingly no punishment. And I'll let you read the article, but let me just skip to near the end where it says the following. Jehovah extended mercy, apparently because he knew 
what attempts the soldiers had made, even though they were very tired and hungry. God may also have taken into account that Saul's rash oath had pressed his men into that desperate situation. So this was a desperate situation that required mercy from Jehovah. How could those words not be applied to a Jehovah's Witness on an operating table whose life hangs in the balance? Why are they not worthy of mercy? Why are they not worthy of, of special allowances in their desperate situation? But you have here this story in the Bible where, oh no, you don't understand, the soldiers were in a desperate situation that required mercy to be extended, so they got let off the hook. It's two completely different standards the Watchtower doesn't even try to address. They're just counting on you as a Jehovah's Witness, not stumbling on these verses. And if you do stumble on them, they're counting on you, not thinking this through rationally and realizing that there's a huge double standard here. But we must press on to our next question under consideration, which is, is abstaining from blood a personal choice. Lots of Jehovah's Witnesses, including some of you who may be watching this, will argue that yes, it is a personal choice. We all get to decide what we do with our bodies, what we allow into our bodies, what medical treatments we allow to be performed on our own bodies. And that's certainly true. But in the case of the blood prohibition, and the way Watchtower goes about enforcing it, I would argue strongly that it isn't necessarily a personal decision to abstain from blood. Exhibit A in making my argument would have to be this notorious Awake magazine cover from 1994. The lead article there, Youths Who Put God First, and the magazine doesn't really require too much explanation. Here you have Watchtower celebrating the deaths of children. Incidentally, I've heard lots of people say that there are dozens of victims featured in this article. I think that that might be a misinterpretation of the cover art. When you look more closely at the cover, it appears that some of the faces are actually stock imagery. But certainly the three faces, the three main um, children who are featured on that front cover, all of them died refusing blood. And when you go through the magazine, it's actually heartbreaking to read this awake and not just see children who are being coerced into throwing their lives away due to the indoctrination of their parents, but the way this is being milked for propaganda value. And my argument would be, if, if abstaining from blood, if refusing blood transfusions is a purely personal choice, why is this emotional manipulation, why is this propaganda necessary? Why can't it simply be a case of Watchtower making the information available letting witnesses decide for themselves, and that's that. Why do they have to publish this sort of grotesque material, which again celebrates the essential martyrdom of young Jehovah's Witnesses? There are other examples throughout Watchtower literature of children dying in observance of the blood teaching. I won't go through all of them in this video, but there's another example of Joshua Walker, who died refusing blood in 1994. His story was just tragic. And if any of you watching this have by any chance seen the Leah Remini a and &E special, which I was honoured to be included in, they're one of the most poignant parts of that special show on Jehovah's Witnesses was the part where Anthony Morris relates the story of Joshua Walker at a recent convention and seems to relish 
Joshua making the ultimate sacrifice for his beliefs. When Josh was in the hospital, uh, he said, Mom, a lot of times when you go to the bathroom or go to get Dad, the doctors come in. And here's what they say. Josh, you need a blood transfusion. Without it, you will die. We want to help you. You know what Josh responded? All alone. Then please respect my wishes about blood. The best thing for me is to respect the sanctity of life, and if I die, I will live again. Good example of faith in the face of incredible stress and persecution. Amazing young fellow. And when he's resurrected, see, you'll hear more from him because Jehovah loves that. What this amounts to is emotional manipulation and peer pressure. If it's all about personal choice for you as a Jehovah's Witness refusing blood, why is this necessary? Why do you have to be manipulated in such a distasteful way with examples of children who have died being put in front of you and watched her effectively saying, they did it, you should do it too. Another tragic story, which you're not going to find in Watchtower publications, or at least you won't find it yet, is that of Eloise Dupuis, who tragically died on October 12th, 2016, at the age of 26. She died refusing blood at a medical facility in Canada after she developed serious complications giving birth, she refused blood and she died. But what's interesting and also very disturbing about Eloise's story is what her relatives have to say, particularly her non-believing relatives, because they put forth a big effort to reach through to Eloise when it became obvious that things were very dire. They tried to visit her to number one, see her in her final hours, but number two, if possible, try and persuade her to accept a life-saving blood transfusion. And what's incredible is that they were met with essentially a wall of Watchtower elders. Because if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you'll know that when a Jehovah's Witness is admitted to hospital and the issue of blood comes up, a hospital liaison committee is dispatched. And when you're a witness, the understanding is, well, they're there to help you. They are there to speak with the doctor and make sure that your rights are respected. What you don't consider when you're a Jehovah's Witness is that these elders are being sent to make sure that you toe the line, make sure that you stand firm on the issue of blood. Because when you're in a life or death situation, you can sometimes change your mind. When the chips are down and it's, it's looking like you're really going to die, who knows what decision you might make? Who knows what personal decision you might make? But because it isn't really a personal decision, because Watchtower doesn't trust you as a Jehovah's Witness to make this personal decision, they send out these hospital liaison committees, and in the case of Eloise Dupuis, these men stopped Eloise's non-JW relatives from getting through and seeing her in her final hours. And I want to cover Eloise's story in more detail in a future video, because there's so much to talk about. But I do just want to play a recording. This is an interview with Ian Mitchell, who is a doctor and medical ethicist from the University of Calgary. And Dr. Mitchell has some very interesting observations to make about the hospital liaison committees. What I learned is that this young woman gave birth to a child, had hemorrhage, in which it was thought transfusion would be life-saving. She refused the transfusion and died. 
uh, leaving, of course, a newborn infant instantly motherless. At the same time, she had many friends outside of her religious community who tried to have access to her, who tried to persuade her to have the transfusion and were blocked by members of the religion. Mm -hmm. These are the, the groups that, that are called hospital liaison committees that, yes. uh, that belong to the Jehovah's Witness right. faith. So these are specially trained elders who are dispatched when there's an issue of transfusion. Uh, they occupy space in the hospital. They make it nearly impossible for often for ordinary work to be done and certainly for visitors not of the faith to have access to this young woman. You've had experience with these groups. Yes. Can you describe what it's like? Uh, yes, it's very uncomfortable. They are, I have to say, very polite. Uh, they are never rude. They are never violent. They, are, they come in. They're well-dressed. There are a number of them. Uh, they are persistent. They want to be part of every conversation that a physician has with the family, which is a very unusual event. They have very specific medical suggestions to make, which is very unusual for people accompanying families. Not that we expect families to necessarily agree with us and not do their own looking, but it is very unusual for family friends to come in and be so persistent and so specific in medical suggestions on treatment. They are given information which is very dated. They are told in uh, I didn't look at the website this morning, but two or three days ago, information on blood is that you will get aid. It's that is now extremely unlikely, which is medical work for nearly impossible, extremely unlikely, uh, that if someone is homosexual and you get blood from them, you will become homosexual. This is impossible. So they're given misinformation and they're coerced. So it does not fulfill the requirements of an advanced directive. So what's a doctor to do? faced with this decision, faced with, on the one hand, the knowledge that you just told us about that's, that's widely available, that's out there, but on the other hand, the knowledge that if they do disobey the, the order on that card, they could face legal consequences. You ask what should the doctor do, I think we need to think about what should healthcare organizations do, and I will answer your question, but let me deal with the healthcare organizations first. Uh, we would expect, in terms of Eloise, this young woman who died in Quebec, that her husband would have a role in guiding her, that her parents might, that perhaps, if she, I don't know if she had sisters, but they would be part of it. We would not expect strangers from her church to be part of that decision-making. So I think our hospitals and healthcare organizations need to think about how they respond to these non-family members coming in. So, so the first thing is deal with these hospital liaison committees. I think the physicians are in a nearly impossible situation because they're given legal advice and they will be given legal advice that you must accept a card. And yet the physician, you know, we do try and do good. Most of us are law-abiding people, don't understand the subtleties of the coercion and are likely to let the person die. And I have to say that every healthcare practitioner, physician, nurse, technologist, laboratory aides, cleaner, anyone, are extremely saddened with these unnecessary deaths of young people. So there'll be enormous sadness, but nevertheless, most will obey the law. And I'm sure, to be fair, enormous sadness on the part of the Jehovah's Witnesses who are in the room as well. I would hope so. I have no evidence of that uh, because, in fact, uh, martyrs are created. Dr. Mitchell, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Tim. So what Dr. Mitchell had to say there, I just found fascinating, coming from a medical professional who is, in, who is frequently in situations where he's desperately trying to save the life of a Jehovah's Witness. It's his job to save their lives and... They also, they're also the ones who have to deal with the trauma if they lose their patient, especially the trauma of losing a patient who refuses life-saving treatment. And additionally complicating matters is the fact that you've got these, these random dudes showing up saying, oh, we're the hospital liaison committee, we're here to help. And rather than it being a case of the doctor helping the patient and having this line of communication, there's a third party involved. And again, if it's, if it's a case of personal choice, 
What is the relevance? What is the need for the Hospital Liaison Committee? It's quite obvious to any witnesses watching this, I hope, when you really think about it, that this is a case of coercion. This is a case of undue influence. This is a case of witnesses in a desperate situation being bullied into following what Watchtower requires of them. And just as a side note, if, there are, if there's anyone watching this who happens to be involved in, let's say, legislation for hospitals, who is looking into the issue of Jehovah's Witnesses and blood transfusions and what can be done, I would say that as an urgent measure, we need to be keeping hospital liaison committees out of hospitals. They are not there for the patient's benefit, they are there for the religion's benefit and making sure that, again, that the patient capitulates, that the patient toes the line. These men have no right inside hospital wards manipulating the issue and coercing patients into what treatment they receive or don't receive. But another story I just want to quickly show you is that of Phil Dunn. Phil Dunn is not, thankfully, a victim of the blood teaching. I actually had the honour of interviewing Phil a few years ago now, and his story is just phenomenal because, again, it highlights this issue of personal choice. And I just want to show you a few clips from my interview with Phil. I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which is a type of uh, cancer of the immune system. Uh, there was a tumor in my stomach that had grown so large that it actually tore a hole in it. And one night I was just at home watching TV. Uh, I felt very queasy. I went up to the bathroom to, to throw up and I passed out on the floor and I had a seizure. And when I got to the hospital, they told me that I was bleeding internally. and. Without a blood transfusion, I would most likely die within the next couple of days. Wow. If you've never been in that situation, you don't know, but the doctors will come in privately and they will tell you that they can give you blood without anybody ever knowing. They even can have bags that are not labeled, that are uh, not see-through, so you and can't And the see. tube would have to obviously not be see-through. Yeah. They, they told me that <laughs> yeah. you could even have somebody in the room and you would they wouldn't know that you were getting a blood transfusion. But right. It was mostly, I, I, I was terrified of dying, but at the same time, I felt that I couldn't live with the guilt of having had a blood transfusion because at that time, I was still, you know, believed in what Watchtower had mm. taught me. Having to keep it secret from my family, it would probably just tear me apart. I would feel guilty, especially they would probably be uh, proud of me for refusing a blood transfusion and I had secretly taken one then. I would just feel guilty every time that it's brought up and they use me as a good example. So I, even though I wasn't sure at the time whether or not I really believed that I was going to wake up in paradise if I died, I really was on the fence about it. I just knew that I couldn't go on living my life with that kind of guilt if I had uh, taken the blood transfusion. So what I found fascinating there is that Phil basically admitted that when he was a believing Jehovah's Witness in that situation, he refused simply because he couldn't live with himself if he went ahead and had the blood. He couldn't live with the guilt. He couldn't live with his congregation applauding him and viewing him as a hero when none of them knew that actually he had secretly received blood. And so he was willing to die rather than go through a life of inner turmoil due to making that decision. Again, how can this be called personal choice when you have emotional manipulation through propaganda articles that celebrate the martyrdom of children, when you have hospital liaison committees dispatched to the bedside to make sure that the patient capitulates, when you have People like Phil Dunn, who feel as though they don't have a choice, they can't conceive of going through life living a pretense when in actual fact they caved in and they accepted a life-saving transfusion. And bottom line, here is the ultimate reason why it simply cannot be said that the blood teaching is a personal choice. 
If you as a Jehovah's Witness are threatened with shunning, if you accept a blood transfusion, how can it be a personal choice? If you are being threatened with being separated from your family, and I've already shown in the Elder's Shepherd book where it says that if you willfully and unrepentantly take blood, you are liable to disassociation and therefore to being shunned by everyone who's a Jehovah's Witness who you know and care about by your own flesh and blood. They will be weaponized against you if you go ahead and accept a life-saving blood transfusion. Where is the personal choice in any of this? Which brings us to our penultimate question. Is it ethical to deny blood transfusions for children? And I'm going to answer this as quickly as possible because I don't think it requires too much reasoning or argumentation. I don't think it's ever ethical to kill a child because of what your religious beliefs are. You as an adult have the right, as I've already said, to decide what treatments you receive, what medicine, what fluids are permitted into your body. You can, I'm even, I would even go as far as to say that it's your right to die under certain circumstances. If you feel that your life is intoler intolerable, if you have some illness that means you're constantly in pain, I'm one of those people who believes that your right to medicine includes your right to euthanasia under certain circumstances. But what you absolutely cannot argue is that a child should be expected to die due to the religious beliefs of that child's parents until they are considered by law to be an adult. They absolutely should be protected by the courts and it should be ensured that they receive all the medical care that they need or that the doctors determine that they need. Now, thankfully, we're already seeing story after story, case after case in numerous countries where Jehovah's Witness parents face this dilemma and the decision is taken out of their hands by a judge and the doctors get the green light to save the child. But I wanted to include this question anyway, just in case you happen to be watching this as a Jehovah's Witness, as a believing Jehovah's Witness with a child. And I just want to basically implore you and reach out to your humanity. Do you really want to see your child die in this situation? Is it right that your child should have to pay the ultimate sacrifice because of your personal religious beliefs? This is a question which, if nothing else, I would implore you to think very carefully about. And before I move on to the next question, indeed the final question, I just want to leave you Jehovah's Witness parents with this one thought, especially if I'm speaking to a mother. When your child was in your womb, your child was already receiving your blood. It's commonly known that mothers, pregnant mothers, exchange blood with the babies in their wombs. They exchange white blood cells through the breast milk, but there's also a medical condition called RH sensitization. RH sensitization, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, please research this. It's a bit complicated and I'm not sure my head fully understands it, but basically RH sensitization is something that happens because of the exchange of red blood cells between mother and baby. So that future pregnancies, there can be complications due to um, the, the different types of blood between the mother and the child. But you have this situation where you're allowed to receive another human being's blood so long as you're still in the womb. And yet once you're out of the womb, once you've been born, oh, well, from this point forward, you're not allowed to receive another human being's blood. How, why would Jehovah have this crazy mixed up way of doing things so that it's okay to sustain a child's life 
with someone else's blood when they're still in the womb, but once they get out of the womb, they're on their own. So now we've reached the point in the video where I'm down to my last question, which is, is the blood teaching worth dying for? And that's a question that you, as a Jehovah's Witness watching this, have to obviously decide for yourself. I can't make that decision for you, but I would certainly hope that based on some of the information I presented to you, which I think you'll agree, not all of it is discussed in Watchtower publications. In fact, most of it is not discussed or is completely ignored. Hopefully I've presented some compelling reasons for you to at least reevaluate whether this is number one, a valid teaching, and number two, a teaching that is valid enough, important enough for you to lay down your life. And before I go, I do just want to read from my book, The Reluctant Apostate. And actually, uh, this is The Reluctant Apostate. It has a chapter in it. Uh, chapter nine is Blood and Tears. And the information I've presented in this video is mostly based on that chapter, Blood and Tears, because I obviously had to research this issue when writing that chapter. And I would urge you, if you're interested, to... If you're interested in exploring these issues in more detail, by all means, check out the book. But I wanted to read to you from part of my chapter that explores the scope of this and the impact it's having on Jehovah's Witnesses. The true body count resulting from the blood ban will perhaps always remain a mystery. Despite being proud of its stance, Watchtower is not quite proud enough to report the number of witnesses who die observing it. But every now and then, we find clues hinting at the scale of the carnage. For example, a paper was published in 2011 titled Clinical Benefits and Cost-Effectiveness of Allergenic Red Blood Cell Transfusion in Severe Symptomatic Anemia. The paper gave a chilling insight into the rates of witness mortality due to blood refusal. Results were shown from a study of four major public hospitals in New Zealand from 1998 to 2007. It found that out of 103 witness patients who suffered severe anemia, lack of haemoglobin in the blood, 21 died. All 103 refused blood, but were agreeable to alternative treatments. When 103 non-witness patients in similar circumstances were randomly picked, it was found that only two of these died. Hence, over the same period, the mortality rate of witnesses who refused blood was 10 times that of non-witnesses who did not. That for me was one of the most chilling parts of my writing process for the entire book. When you're confronted with that scale of carnage, when we're talking about Jehovah's Witnesses dying at a rate of 10 times that of non-witnesses in the same situation, I mean, it's very difficult to extrapolate meaningful numbers from just this one study. This, we're talking about a finite period of time in New Zealand. Is it really fair to then say, oh, well, let's calculate what it would be worldwide because every country is different, different, you know, different cultures can impact the numbers in different ways. But even so, I think it's been estimated that based on these figures, we're potentially looking at tens of thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses dying since 1945 due to this blood teaching. As someone raises a witness, as someone who knows hundreds of Jehovah's Witnesses, albeit who are shunning me, I just find it so sad that Watchtower has this much blood on their hands, that they are responsible for killing this many Jehovah's Witnesses, if these numbers are anything to go by, to be 10 times more likely to die 
when you're in this particular situation, it's it doesn't bear thinking just how much death there has been due to the blood teaching. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness, it's really worth thinking about whether it's worthwhile, whether it's worthwhile sticking to this with so much at stake. And I will leave you with one more thought, which is something I have expressed in uh, on the Leah Remini show, which is that how would Watchtower reverse this even if they wanted to? Even if the governing body wanted to stop this, wanted to put an end to the carnage, how could they at this point? When you've already killed potentially tens of thousands of people, how do you say, we got that wrong? You can't, can you? You're already committed at that point. So more Jehovah's Witnesses are going to die. There will potentially be Jehovah's Witnesses maybe even dying right at this moment due to this teaching, which is a really disturbing thought. But hopefully just by raising some of these issues in the form of different questions, I've at least given you something to think about, uh, enabling you, hopefully, if you ever are in this life or death situation, to reach a truly informed position. So anyway, I hope this video has given you food for thought. Again, if you want this information more comprehensively, you can find it in my book, The Reluctant Apostate, which is on Amazon. I also need to quickly thank my Patreon supporters who actually suggested this video. We have a monthly vote where they let me know what subjects they want me to discuss and this was one they picked and they keep picking interesting subjects for me to get my teeth into and I'm very grateful for their input. But that's about all I've got for you. Please don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more videos and as always, thank you for watching.